You're listening to episode 242 of Mito Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn, and today I'm interviewing Gerald Pollack. Jerry maintains an active laboratory at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's the founding editor-in-chief of Water, a multidisciplinary research journal. He's the executive director of the Institute for Venture Science, co-founder of Fourth Phase Incorporated, and founder of the annual conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. I first learned of Jerry's work through reading his book several years ago, the first one being Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, and he released the fourth phase of water in 2013 with the subtitle Beyond Solid, Liquid, and Vapor. And that book in particular really influenced me to look at water in a completely different way. You know, I live here in Idaho, and as long as it's spring water, people are generally happy. And when they see my system of what I put the spring water through, a lot of people would say that it's overkill and unnecessary. But just knowing a few things about Jerry's work, it seems like there's more questions than answers when it comes to the properties of water and what we know about water. So I put the drinking water that goes into my body on even a higher level than the food that I ingest. I look at it as way more important. So in this interview, Jerry talks about the history of how he got involved in water research. He talks about Gilbert Ling and the origin of the phrase structured water. He describes the unique properties of exclusion zone or easy water and the wavelength of light that builds it. He shares why he doesn't buy the cell membrane hypothesis, the recently discovered effects of ultraviolet light on exclusion zone water, whether ATP and the high energy phosphate bond even exists versus exclusion zone charge that's powering the body. He talks about how hyperbaric oxygen therapy increases the exclusion zone, why freshly squeezed fruit and vegetable juices are beneficial, if it's possible to consume or drink exclusion zone water. Talk about Victor Schauberger, gelatin, deuterium depleted water, EMF radiation, grounding and earthing, Masaru Emoto's experiments and how water carries information. One of my favorite things about hosting this podcast is interviewing people that are a lot smarter than me. I think that's the fastest way to grow as a person, the most efficient way, and to grow in wisdom. But what I really appreciate about Jerry, and I said this at the end of the show with him, I appreciate how humble he is. I noticed that's really rare nowadays, when there's a person getting up there in chronological age, and there's this extreme arrogance that I've noticed with a lot of health educators. And I don't get that at all with Jerry, which is just so refreshing. And it makes me way less resistant to the new ideas that he introduces. I'm way more receptive to considering them. So enjoy the show. Here is Jerry Pollock. All right, Jerry Pollack, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Uh, It's great to be here with you. Uh, Yeah, and uh, looking forward. Yeah, likewise, very much so. I've been studying natural health for a little over 13 years now, and my introduction was into grounding and earthing and um, uh, tried all these different types of water from distilled to well to spring. and your name kept coming up in, you know, in the in the sphere of of community that I was in, as far as um, using sunlight and cold therapy and this kind of idea of quantum health to support uh, human physiology. And so I ended up purchasing your book, uh, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, and then the Fourth Phase of Water. And um, it's very complex. You know, I think for for the layperson, um, uh, 
reading those books uh, could seem complex, but then I listen to you in interviews and the way you describe things, it's very eloquent and easy to understand. And I think that's uh, that's well, very useful. <laughs> well, I appreciate that uh, very much. I tried my best to uh, uh, to make the arguments in those books as as simple and palatable as possible, but you know, it's a challenge to do that. Um, you know, it, it's easy. It's easy to write um, uh, to my colleagues, you know, because I'm so accustomed to speaking to them, and then to try to make the uh, the information accessible to people who don't have that that kind of background and education. It, it, it's something of a challenge. I thought I succeeded reasonably well, but uh, maybe not quite. The fourth phase has become really, really popular. It's been translated into roughly 10 languages. And, uh, you know, it's been out for 10 years now and the sales each year keep increasing. I, I'm I'm surprised. I'm, I'm shocked. So uh, word of mouth has, seems to um, uh, have have prevailed and and uh, well I'm happy that I able able to convey the message uh, there, there's a lot in those books uh, there is yeah yeah I was reviewing the fourth phase uh last night in my deck and it's it's a really enjoyable book especially with the illustrations that definitely helps the lay person you know without a strong scientific background to kind of grasp the concepts to see the the pictures in there well, I appreciate the comments. Uh, you know, I wish my son were here to hear them because he's the <laughs> artist, uh, and uh, he—he's really gifted. He's a—he's actually trained as a sculptor, and he—he um, he spent his younger days working as an a, a apprentice for a, a famous sculptor named uh, Jeff Koons, who uh, uh, kind of dominates the U.S. sculpture uh, world. And one day he said. Dad, I would like to illustrate your books, and uh, and there we have it. And it's been a distinct pleasure, and almost an, you might say, an honor to have worked with him. And he has a uh, an uncanny ab uh, ability to illustrate scientific concepts uh, because he understands them very well. It's his is uh, not only his artistic uh, ability, but his in intelligence, and it really works so well. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. I, I think we, we've we been working together now for, oh, uh, more than a decade. Uh, and and I don't think we ever had a disagreement. Uh, <laughs> you know, he'd come in with something and he'd say, okay, dad, this is what I think. And I said, well, no, it's not quite this. And we'd go back and forth. And there's no ego involved. We, we come up with the ideal solution uh, to so anyway, and there are cartoons sprinkled throughout the book. Uh, that's a product of, I guess, both of us. We we uh, we're not so uh, we don't need to be so serious about everything. You know, sometimes a cartoon is the best way best way to illustrate. So anyway, thank you for the comments about the artwork. Um, Ethan would appreciate that. I love it. Did Ethan ever get into claymation? Just cu out of curiosity, claymation. Yeah, you know, like Wallace and Gromit, where it's like the moving sculptures. That kind uh, of, uh, no, as far as I know. Uh, okay, I uh, I'm not sure what that is. So uh, I, I was a huge sculptor growing up. It's basically where you create a sculpture, you move it, take a picture, move it, take a picture, and it makes the illusion that it's a uh, moving. You know. Well, n n no, uh, I don't think he's gotten into that. He's uh, he's gotten. <laughs> into a uh, uh, home remodel, which is <laughs> a bit of a frustration. It's, uh, you know, he, he, his expanding family meant that his home needed um, more space. And he, he undertook the project. He decided that uh, he'd be the general contractor because it would save money. And also, it, it you know, in, in the more demanding aspects of it, he would do it himself and it would get done right. Turned out to be a three and a half year project uh, during which all artwork was abandoned. So I have two more books in progress, and uh, they all came to a grinding halt for three and a half years. He's back in gear, and I'm thrilled. Uh, so next two books will be out um, before we know it. Oh, that's great! Great news. Well, um, yeah, that 
going too far into the weeds here, but I, I appreciate the the backstory on the books. That was fascinating. Uh, how did you get into this whole um, topic? As I mentioned before, we got on the air, I listened to a bunch of your other podcasts and um, I have some idea, but for the listeners, um, just ha- how did you get interested in easy water and studying it? And Well, I didn't, I didn't get interested in easy water. We, we found something that we eventually called easy water. Uh, um, well, uh, um, it all started uh, a couple of decades ago, a little more than a couple of decades ago. We had been studying uh, muscle contraction and um, uh, I'm not sure how, how much to, to go into that. But anyway, the, the view that we, w- 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 one aspect of people's understanding of the molecular mechanism it, it all it all comes from a theory put forth by a great towering figure in science, a Nobel laureate, Sir Andrew Huxley, who was a member of the famous Huxley family, uh, and many many people followed his um, uh, his his example and his model. And we did experiments in the lab, none of which agreed with the model. And so, you know, <laughs> well. When the experimental results don't agree with the, with the model, there there is a problem, and and um, and we went on for uh, some decades to uh, come forth with another uh, kind of understanding of of muscle contraction at the molecular level. And one thing that uh, that had struck me as we went on to study contraction is that is that people who uh, are scientists who study this area of the molecular mechanism of contraction, presume that the muscle proteins and components are acting in a vacuum. You never see water. Water doesn't exist. It's as though, you know, you can look in any textbook, um, uh, muscle contraction, and 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 they will uh, uh, depict the various proteins that are involved in it, and, and you never see a water molecule, but you know, water, um, two thirds of muscle by volume, two thirds uh, is water. Uh, you know, and and so you can't you can't kind of say, well, you know, I'll I'll just get rid of the water, and don't don't bother with that. And as you you, you probably know, um, some people don't. If you do a molecular count, um, you count all all the molecules. Uh, in the muscle, or, or for that matter, all the molecules in practically any um, any organ in the body. If you line up all the molecules and start counting, you'll find that more than 99 out of 100 molecules are water molecules. Um, you know, so because the water molecule is so, so small that, you know, to make up that, that uh, uh, two-thirds by volume, you need to put a lot of water molecules. If you do the count, it's it's more than ninety nine out of a hundred. Now think about it. Um, the the current idea is that those water molecules don't do anything. So ninety nine out of a hundred of the molecules in your muscle don't do anything. So just you know omit them. <laughs> uh, that that seems presumptuous, if not arrogant, to think that. You know, ninety-nine out of a hundred of the molecules in your muscle are—you know—they're just sitting there. They don't—they don't have anything to do with uh, contraction. And so that was a—that was a concept that kind of puzzled me. And then one day, I was picking up uh, a colleague who was supposed to work in my laboratory for the next year. Uh, he had just come from Hungary, and I was driving him, his wife, from the airport to my home, where I was going to put them up until they could find a place to live. And in the car, Charles said to me, he said, you know, there's a, there's a conference in Hungary and you should go. This conference is to honor, uh, honor a famous, a famous biophysicist, a Hungarian biophysicist who had passed recently. And he was a distinguished guy and he had two areas of interest, muscle contraction and water. And he said, you should go to represent muscle contraction because he also was a non-believer in in the sort of, sort of standard model of muscle contraction. So I said, okay. So I went, and it changed my life. Uh, it changed my life, not 
because of any contribution I made in speaking about muscle contraction, but in meeting a whole bunch of people who had something to say about the topic of water. And, um, and this guy, uh, uh, to, uh, who, who is being honored, uh, or his uh, memorial uh, to this guy, uh, w- was doing some serious thinking about, about water. And the people who were invited to the conference um, were, were uh, people who also were doing serious thinking. And the major person who was there and who I met who changed my life is a guy named Gilbert Ling. Um, and Gilbert Ling, Gilbert Ling was uh, a guy, he, he, he came from, from China. He was in the first cohort of Chinese scientists sent to the U.S., uh, to study. So they looked all over China, all over China, and they picked three who were the most promising. There was a, a physicist, a chemist, and he was the, Gilbert was the biologist. Um, and the physicist won a Nobel Prize, and the chemist, I'm told, but I, I, I haven't followed up, also won a Nobel Prize. And Gilbert Ling should have won at least two Nobel Prizes uh, for what he contributed. And what he contributed was was uh, about water. He said something that, that really made a mark and also made him grossly unpopular. He said that in biology, in the cell, the water is not liquid water, you know, and, and that's a, a kind of a shock for most people to think that, oh, well, wait a second, we learned that the cell was full of liquid water. He said, no, it's kind of different. It's not uh, ordinary liquid water. He said that the water molecules um, um, were actually lined up like soldiers at attention. Um, and if you think of the water molecule as a dipole, you know, a little bean uh, with a plus at one end, minus at the other end, you can imagine how they could stack one another. And that was Gilbert Lane's point, which, which, by the way, parenthetically, um, we found was not quite right. I'll speak to that in, in a moment. But the idea is that he, he said that the water in biology uh, was structured he used the term, which means it has a kind of structure, um, and I, I was I was impressed uh, by that. I was impressed by uh, his presentation, by the evidence he presented, and even more than that, by the dozen or so other people who were there to present supporter evidence. Uh, in my my head was swimming. I couldn't believe what I was what I was hearing, and so uh, I returned to Seattle and. Um, and I thought, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too, too easily, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 what's the word? I'm, I'm searching, uh, searching for, impressed by interesting ideas, and I wanted to see whether, whether my impression was, you know, sort of okay. So I, I got one of his books, and I gave it to a few of my uh, more promising students, and they came back to me, and the, and and their response was was the same, um, uh, was uniform. They said, this is absolutely amazing. If this guy is right, it means that all of biology is wrong. Uh, it needs to be reconceived from the ground up because, you know, we all think that the water in the cell is just like ordinary water. And if this is true, it's not at all like ordinary water and it, it changes so so much of, of biology. So I was convinced, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, trust my my own reaction but I, I I trusted more the reactions of of my students and postdocs and so I thought okay what am I going to do next and 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 what I did next was was to do uh, uh, to write the book that you mentioned cells gels and the engines of life um, and I wanted to do it because um, Gilbert Ling's books uh, though the material in it is so profound, he wasn't the best writer um, of all. He'd sit down at, at the typewriter or later at the word processor. He'd bat out something and send it to the publisher and it would get published. Uh, and the word editing, I think, was uh, out, outside his lexicon. Or <laughs> he, uh, he simply never heard the word, didn't understand that you know other people are not as gifted as he might be in understanding and and that books need to be edited. Um, uh, I I know that. So 
So I, I thought, well, what I want to do is write a book that explains Gilbert Ling's ideas um, in a form that's uh, digestible, palatable. And from the comment you made, maybe it's not so digestible, but I, you know, I made I made my a, attempt, and I I did go a bit beyond that, um, uh, talking about um, some uh, additional stuff that Gilbert did not like. Um, and he actually, when he saw my book, he was angry. Um, and uh, he got angry with me because I think I think he thought I was stealing his thunder. He he complained to me and loudly to other people in the field uh, 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 that um, I didn't give him enough credit. Um, I thought I did, uh, but you know he was kind of expecting that I would mention the name Gilbert Ling in every paragraph. Uh, uh, you know, I think it was clear to most readers that this is his work, not not mine, and and I was just trying to convey it in in a, a way that was was clear. Uh, but that anger persisted for quite a few years. I tried my best uh, to to um, to make friends, and and finally I succeeded. Um, it was when we found evidence for long range ordering of water. That I presented at a conference. He was sitting in the audience, and he stood up, and he, he, he. If he had a flag, he'd be waving that flag and cheering. He was so enthusiastic about it, and and from then on, we 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 became friends. But anyway, uh, I gave you a long answer to to the short question about uh, how how we we got interested, and and I just I just add one uh, one little comment to that. Uh, um, the way you can tell, uh, one way you can tell that that the water in your cells uh, is not liquid water is to cut yourself. Take a razor blade, you know, if you have the courage, and and, and cut yourself. And of course, the blood comes out, but the water doesn't flow out, you know. And if if it were water that's uh, in the, uh, liquid water that's in in the cells, it would it would pour out as as it pours out from a breached water pipe. You know, but that doesn't happen. And and I'm told by surgeons that you know they cut deeply into the tissue and they'll cut right through, for example, through a muscle, and the water doesn't doesn't leak out at all. Um, you know, so so it's not liquid water; it's something it's something else. And it turns out it's more it's more gel like, uh, sort of like a raw egg white. Anyway, you, you asked me the question, and I apologize for the length of my answer. No, that was that was incredible. Appreciate it, wow. um, and all the analogies are super helpful too. Um, so this this easy water, there's um, a lot of properties to it. I've heard you talk about how it holds an electric charge, um, and does it uh, exclude like repel things as well? Is that where the name comes from? Yeah, um, that's that's in fact um, how uh, the first experiments that we did. Uh, that's how the name exclusion zone came. We you know, Gilbert Ling it started with Gilbert Ling's ideas and his idea uh, of the the water molecules lining up. That's sort of like a crystal, sort of like ice, but not ice, like a crystal. And just like ice, you know, ice excludes all the impurities because in order to get a, a pure crystal, it can't have impurities; otherwise, not pure. And it pushes out the the impurities and. And so it's sort of like uh, you you see a glacier, and then uh, at the foot of the glacier you see a glacial moraine. It's pushed out everything from inside, and it's pure. So we were looking, we we're looking uh, for an experimental preparation in in which, uh, in which uh, particles we put particles in the water, and we're looking for a preparation where these particles are excluded, and we found it, and we found it rather quickly. And we started studying this because the phenomenon to us was so interesting. Imagine a region um, of, um, uh, say, almost half a millimeter. We found we found uh, larger uh, regions later, uh, where where we had no particles, and the rest of the rest of the suspension had lots of particles, but that region had none. Um, and and so we began uh, calling it exclusion zone. Uh, it was. It was from the advice of an Australian colleague that you got to give it a name. You can't you can't go into a few paragraphs of discussion. <laughs> you could give it a name, and he said, "Why not call it exclusion zone?" Uh, 
that's easy and it's easy to remember. <laughs> so we called it exclusion zone. Later, we found that this region had uh, extraordinary properties that differed markedly from ordinary uh, water. And that's when we began calling the fourth phase of water. Um, so that that's how all of that came about. And uh, and we were so excited by by what we found. Um, uh, um, and that, that's what led to so much new information and um, and yeah okay so I, I think I don't remember what was your initial uh, question but I uh, I'm not sure if, if I no, that's, yeah that was great yeah where the exclusion zone name came from and if oh, it excludes okay. things and then the negative charge was another aspect I asked well about. yeah that, so that negative charge so l- let me explain that um, uh, everything starts with water water is neutral um, and um, and we found uh, in our experiments that um, so we we have a chamber and the chamber contained water and particles or molecules and it also contained uh, uh, some material uh, it could be a gel it could be a polymeric material uh, it could be a biological material and and we found that right next to the material those microspheres or particles were excluded. So that's the zone we're looking at. And we stuck an electrode in that zone, and it turned out, uh, in in most cases, that it was negatively charged. We used tiny electrodes uh, called microelectrodes, parenthetically uh, invented by the same Gilbert Ling. He should have gotten a Nobel Prize for that because it, it was used by others who then got Nobel Prizes. <laughs> so you know, uh, for what for what it's worth. Uh, we found it's negative, but if you think about it, if you start with neutral water and you wind up uh, with a negatively charged region, there's got to be a positively charged region, right? Because you, you can't um, take something neutral and uh, and convert it to something that's negative. There's got to be some, you know, the and, and we found that the positive charges existed just beyond the EZ. So you've got a material... You've got the EZ or fourth phase uh, zone that's negative, and you've got another zone beyond that actually is positive that uh, uh, contains basically free protons or protons linked to water, hydronium ions. That's a battery. And and that's the interesting part because uh, we have a battery now, and batteries, you know, batteries uh, contain energy, uh, uh, potentially energy that can be released. Uh, and and so, indeed, um, if this sort of thing exists in biology, it, it's potential energy that's available to power um, various biological processes, uh, and that you know that that's very exciting. Um, in the it, yeah, so so um, yeah, maybe I should stop at that point and not wait wait for more questions. But this is the exciting part because. It means that wherever you have EZ, negatively charged, and positively charged beyond, you have a source of energy, of, of power. Um, and now your your next question might be, well, ha, you need energy, or you need energy to create energy. You know, you don't you don't get energy from nowhere, uh, right? It, it, it's a, that would be a so called perpetual motion machine, which doesn't exist, and um, even even radicals like myself uh, agree that you know you can't you can't get something for nothing so so uh, we, we found you haven't asked me but i'll say we found that what i've told you about 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 uh the bat the construction of a battery easy negative the region beyond positive is um is powered by infrared energy um and we found that it was a student who was who was working in the laboratory, and um, like um, many of the students, I encouraged them to do what they're not told to do. <laughs> and and so this guy, it's got a young undergraduate student, and he's he's working at the bench, and uh, he's he's uh, he's working with a chamber, uh, the kind I described to you, little particles and water and uh, some material surface, and it was a gooseneck lamp sitting next to him. So he took the gooseneck lamp and he shined it on the chamber, and in the region uh, where that was illuminated, the exclusion zone grew immensely. Uh, 
you know? And so it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out uh, that it, it looks like the energy is coming from light of some sort coming from the lamp. So I told him, you know, I said, well, why don't you turn it off and see what happens? And, and sure enough, that expanded region of the exclusion zone uh, retreated back down to its initial level. So the process was reversible. And then we tried serious experiments uh, where we looked at different wavelengths of, of light. Um, you know, and so there's the, the visible region, but at shorter wavelengths, there's ultraviolet, and at the longer wavelengths, there's infrared. So we found that ultraviolet did nothing or nothing to the size. Just recently, we found that it actually increases the charge. That's a, a different issue. And visible light uh, the, throughout the almost the entire visible spectrum did almost nothing. When you get to the longer wavelengths toward the reds, it begins to expand the exclusion zone. And when you go beyond the wavelength of reds into infrared, um, it, it was like gangbusters. Uh, it, it, uh, it built the exclusion zone. We could, we could actually shine infrared light and achieve a 10 times increase in the size of the exclusion zone. So it was clear that it's, it's infrared light. And infrared light is all around us. Mo most most people don't really, uh, uh, unless you're, you know, you're an expert and in, in the field, don't know much about infrared light. You know, you think that in the toaster, you look into the toaster and you can see the coils glowing. Uh, you know, and say, oh yeah, it's heat and it's glowing orange. It must be some kind of infrared, and that's correct. However, infrared is all around us and. And and you can uh, you can you can prove that to yourself in in a, a really simple way. Um, you take a camera uh, uh, that has a sensor, and most cameras have sensors to visible light, but you have a sensor to infrared light. Uh, it doesn't pick up visible light at all. And you darken your room, um, and you take a photograph, and you get a beautiful image of everything: uh, your your headphones, your beard, uh, your uh, your shirt, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, your curved mouth. And and it's completely dark. You can't see a thing, but you're generating infrared light. And that's why that's why it's used for the military at, at, at night when they want to see, you know, what's around them. Um, you, since everything is generating infrared light, you use an infrared camera and you can see. So anyway, that energy, infrared energy, is always around us. And since it's always around us, uh, the energy that's necessary for building the EZ uh, is always there. And therefore, it, under the appropriate conditions, you always have EZ, whether it's in biology or beyond biology. Uh, and so all you need is uh, 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 water and you need a hydrophilic surface uh, that, um, you know, a water loving surface we found is that. Um, not strictly a necessary condition, but uh, it, it's um, a condition that really uh, uh, helps. Uh, and you get a you you get this fourth phase or exclusion zone uh, that that builds. So anyway, I'm sorry I gave you a long lecture in response to a short question. But I'll, I'll quit and wait for your. Uh, the answers are phenomenal. I'm loving it. Uh, one one thing that came to mind with the infrared energy is uh as humans we're always creating it but we create it we create heat when we metabolize food to make atp is that my on to something there with you can basically get infrared from eating food releasing heat or get it from sunlight and that's Absolutely. two major right. ways that humans are continually yeah so building them yeah we get it we get it exactly as you say we get it from we get it externally as i described and internally the way you described so it, it it you know we have two sources that uh, ensure that our bodies are filled uh, with with easy uh, water um, uh, there was another aspect to your question that or your comment that I uh, I was uh, going to respond to but uh, 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 what was it Th this this could jog your memory because I I know you're in Seattle. I'm in North Idaho, and I love this climate, and I love the winter, and I love the cold and the snow. Um, 
don't know if it's it's genetics, but I've been kind of meditating on for a while the last several years, like the lack of UV and infrared in the winter and like especially the Pacific Northwest and curious of your thoughts. Is that is do you think it's nature's way of ensuring that we build EZ to make us shiver and kind of had this cold stimulus in the absence of infrared for it for winter or well yeah but the shivering <laughs> is it, it, it's so rare i mean it <laughs> happens only only occasionally uh, yeah. but but yeah it's it's going to generate heat uh, it's going to generate infrared and um you know so so uh it, it it's a good point i i never never thought about it but but you know a lot of people uh from the northwest go south uh during the winter if they can afford it um you know they need the sun and the sun is really important so it's important um i, I don't know how much uh, how much um in north idaho you probably don't have the bleak winters that we have in in, in seattle where the sky is full of dark gray clouds you know um and and when the sun comes out uh, people's the people's faces show smiles. <laughs> you know the sun peeps through, and and the question has always been, well, you know, why why are people smiling? And and the usual response is, oh, it's some kind of psychological effect because the light has come through. But I think it may be more than that because um, the sunlight is not only visible light, but it's heat, and the heat actually is infrared energy, and the infrared energy um, about is about about half the sun's energy is in the infrared region. So what happens is suddenly um, we're exposed to a lot of infrared light that had been blocked by clouds. If the, you know, the cloud suddenly if uh, suddenly opens up and the sun uh, peeps through. And, and that infrared energy penetrates into our brain. And you know that it does because there are, um, um, the evidence is that you can do imaging in the infrared, using infrared light from a source that's outside and it gets inside, gets scattered by your brain and the scattered infrared light comes back and you collect it and you get an image of the brain. So obviously it must go through the skull. And I think it does. And what that does is it builds, um, um, infrared light builds easy in in your brain. And we've, we've demonstrated that uh, you, you know, your cells are filled with easy water, or they should be filled, but sometimes they're not quite filled. And by restoring uh, all of this easy water, you're promoting health and well-being. And your brain, your brain is, you might say, the default state is a state in 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 which you're feeling okay, not depressed, not you know, down in the dumps. And and so this could be could be a reason um, why people smile, at least in Seattle, when the sun peeps through after days of darkness. Um, just, just a thought. Um, That's an interesting, interesting explanation. Uh, you just said something interesting that sometimes the cells aren't quite filled with easy water. So I imagine someone that's dealing with a chronic disease, a serious infection or something, is there always some exclusion zone there? It's is it ever zero in the cell if it's super sick or? Yeah, it is zero if it's super or almost zero if it's super sick. So, um, w- one example uh, that's just come to light recently is a case of cancer. Um, let me back up a uh, step and then uh, please refresh me on the cancer if I if I forget, which uh, sometimes. You know, my thinking is like a tree. Sometimes I go on branches and then forget how to get back to the main limb. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So the question, it, it starts with uh, the electrical potential of the cell. Now, um, the common understanding of the electrical potential of the cell is that it it comes from the membrane. The membrane has pumps and has channels in it, and various ions and other substances uh, are pumped in or out of the cell and pass through specific channels. Um, and I've argued uh, in uh, several books and papers that that idea is erroneous, although it's 
very widely accepted. Um, it's erroneous for several, there are several arguments uh, uh, um, that lead to that. One is that, you know, the cell is, uh, it can be thought of as, for example, as a, a membrane that surrounds a gel. But the gel itself, if you measure the electrical potential of gels, which we've done and other people have done, um, it has roughly the same negative electrical potential as the cell. You know, so, you know, <laughs> you start scratching your head, wait a second, uh, if you don't need a membrane to get that electrical potential, then, then you know, how is it that people are thinking that it somehow comes from the membrane? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't follow logically. And there are other experiments uh, where you punch holes in the cell, in the membrane, and it really doesn't matter. The cell survives perfectly well. There are uh, half a dozen different arguments, and and a, a simpler explanation for the negative electrical potential of the cell is that the cell is filled with easy water. Easy water is negative, and so therefore, you know, if you got a cell that's filled with easy water and easy water is negative, of course you're going to measure negative electrical potential. And most cells, um, the electrical potential is uh, fifty to a hundred millivolts uh, negative. It varies with the with the cell type, and so. Uh, so I would argue that that the reason the cells have negative electrical potential is is very simple. It's that it's filled with easy water that has negative charge. Now, if you if the cell doesn't have um very much easy water, which I argue is a separate argument, that easy water is necessary for function. It's absolutely critical for function. But if it doesn't have enough easy water, it doesn't it doesn't function as well. And I I alluded to the, to the depression that people feel with lack of sunlight. When the sunlight comes through, um, you get infrared energy, the easy uh, peaks, and then you feel better. The cell is operate; your brain cells are operating nor normally. See, so so you take cancer cells now. Um, now ordinary cells, let's say like a pancreatic cell or a, 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 a muscle cell or minus 50 to minus 100 millivolts. Cancer cells, various types, measured like 50 years ago when people were making such measurements, minus 10 instead of minus 50 to minus 100 millivolts. So, you know, the simple interpretation is those cells don't have much easy water. Um, and um, and so uh, that's an example that uh, you were asking about Pathologies and you know cancer cells don't function very well, um, and and also if you look at electron micrographs of those cells, they're usually so-called de-differentiated. They don't have many organelles, and and they don't have many many uh, health healthy organelles. And so the, those organelles, the surfaces of those of those organelles, is what produces the easy water. And if you don't have many of them. Um, you don't have much easy water, so I, I think that there uh, may be a linkage uh, between the absence of easy water and the uh, propensity to develop cancer cells. Uh, that, that that's another issue, and uh, I just submitted a, a manuscript on uh, on that issue, um, and I I think this is uh, maybe a, a kind of a you might say a, a a new sort of a new hypothesis. Uh, most people dealing with cancer are dealing with genomics, and um, you know genomics are inevitably involved in some way. But I think that looking at cancer at at the molecular level of what's going on actually inside the cell may yield some some fresh insights, and we're working on that. Um, so uh, I'm sorry I deviated uh, maybe a bit from. Your question. I can't remember what your question was, <laughs> but there we go. No, that was that, that was awesome. And uh, uh, yeah, I think there was a study recently. I don't know if you saw like the BAC one gene antioxidants in lung cancer. They were saying that antioxidants can increase the risk of lung cancer, and it's interesting all these science things that pop up, sensationalist, and people freak out. You know. Uh, yeah, no, I haven't seen that article. There, I mean, there's so so many articles, so many journals that deal with cancer, and you know the entire focus uh, pretty much 
is on Genolix. Uh, yeah. And uh, if if the if the story rests on genomics, and you know they're, they're in 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 the right area of investigation, if it's something else, primarily, then you know by focusing on genomics, they may not find it. Um, it's it's sort of like you know the the guy who lost his key to his car. You you know that story. Someone comes over and and says, uh, "Can I help you?" Uh, yeah, I'm looking for. The, I lost the keys to my car. And um, are you sure that you lost the keys where you're looking? He said, no, I'm not sure at all. But at least this region uh, is illuminated by the lamp overhead. At least I can see what I'm, I'm doing. But you know, he'll never find the keys. Uh, he's just looking because the light is shining uh, uh, on that region. And you know, the funding for cancer right now is uh, is mostly in the area of genomics. And you know, for scientists who need to put bread on the table, uh, you you get your money where where the money is ample. And and if the money is in the study of genomics, then you know, you better be studying genomics, otherwise you're not gonna get any money. Uh, this is a problem of our, our granting system. It's a it's a different story and I'm happy to get into it, uh, but I think I think this discussion is well, yeah, uh, elsewhere. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I I wonder if it's both. Like I, I have a, a PhD friend that's all about looking at someone's individualized genetics to make a strategy for, you know, nutrition and especially supplementation. Not taking the wrong supplements that's going to, you know, throw them into serotonin syndrome with common calming supplement blends and stuff like that. But he makes the argument that most scientific studies aren't accurate because they're not taking into an account genetics, you know, of the individual when they're feeding all the mice or rats or whatever, the same substance, you know, looking, I, I think you mentioned in the beginning when your experimental results don't agree with the model, there's a problem, which I thought was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that is, that is true. There, there's so much, so much on uh, cancer, so many papers that you know, it's impossible for a researcher to to access and read all of those papers. It just, you know, you don't have the time. Twenty four seven, you won't do it. Uh, yeah, this is a, also a problem. <laughs> yeah, I want uh, I want to circle back to the ultraviolet thing because that's, you know, I've tried a million UV lights, built a little tanning bed up here and stuff, um, and I always knew that ultraviolet was more than vitamin D for most studying health, that there's so much more to it uh, health benefits wise than just increasing your vitamin D status. Um, and I thought it was fascinating that you said it increases increases the charge. I was wondering if you could just expand on that uh, a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, 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 we started from the same viewpoints as yours. Ultraviolet light is doing something. And so a uh, postdoc in the laboratory. Uh, we we discussed following up on that project, and she did, uh, and she did a very nice study, which has just been submitted. And you know, the study is not complicated. So we we look at um, um, uh, at at the exclusion zone, and she's measuring the electrical potential of the exclusion zone, and um, she suddenly uh, turns on. Uh, the uh, UV light at a particular wavelength. She studied 270 nanometers uh, because that has some significance for us. That particular wavelength, and uh, and sure enough, uh, she you know the electrode that's stuck in in the exclusion zone. As soon as she turns the light on, the electrical potential becomes more negative. It's not a hugely more negative, but it's more negative. Um, you know, and and the, her paper is submitted uh, for for publication. We 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 still probably need to um, look at other wavelengths in the ultraviolet region, but you know everything takes time and energy and effort, and we have limited amount of funds to support our our studies, and so you you do what what you can do. So yeah, I mean, going out in the sun, um, if you if you feel energized, uh, um, you know it's possible. It's partly because um, because the infrared energy is expanding the exclusion zone, but also the ultraviolet light that's there is creating more negativity, and the negativity is really the potential energy 
um, you know, your cell, your cell is filled with um, with easy water, and and uh, uh, easy is negative. So you can picture all of those negative charges. They want to get away from each other as you know as quickly and as far as possible, and that's potential energy. Uh, that that energy, and that energy can be used, and I believe it really is used in our in our uh, bodies. Um, so you you mentioned earlier about ATP, and I I, I can't not mention uh, something that the same Gilbert Ling uh, brought to light. Uh, so you know the we all understand that ATP has a high energy phosphate bond, and that high energy phosphate bond is the ultimate source of energy for pretty much everything we do. And that was that that. The study that demonstrated that came out, uh, I can't remember, maybe 80 years ago or something like this. A year later, as Gilbert points out, uh, uh, it's still on, on, I think his website is still live, even though he passed a couple of years ago. Uh, he points out that another group, uh, a year or two later, uh, pointed out, uh, wrote a paper pointing out that the first group was wrong. They made a simple arithmetic error. There is no such thing as a high-energy phosphate bond. Now, uh, uh, since that time, as Gilbert points out, nobody has followed up. So in, it, in reality, we don't know whether the first group was right or the second group was right. And, um, and the, I don't know the answer. I just need to, need to bring up the, the fact that it's really not uh, as certain as we would like like to think, and so if it turns out to be right, uh, that that's fine. If it turns out to be wrong, then you got to look for another energy source, and we found another energy source. It's electrical. Uh, so we, at this point, um, uh, we know that uh, this easy water with this negative charge is a source of potential energy. What we don't know is. Uh, the extent to which it's used in the body, so it may be anywhere between close to zero, or even, you know, uh, uh, much, much more. Uh, we we don't know yet. This is this is a a, a critical uh, um, uh, question that needs to be addressed. Uh, really important. Where do we get our energy? You know, when you think about the people who don't eat, you know, the breatharians. Uh, so if you think, well, where do they? Where do they get their energy? It's certainly not from food, right? Uh, maybe maybe it's from light um, of some sort, of some wavelength that builds easy water. And um, it might be that you know the Breatharians uh, tend tend to be uh, uh, people who who uh, um, are engaged in uh, in prayer. Uh, uh, or meditation and such, and it may maybe uh, their ability to absorb these kinds of energies from the environment is superior to to that of most of us, and they might get quite a lot of energy this way. I don't know the answer to it, but it is a question. I think that that looms that needs to be needs to be addressed. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah. W- with additional funding, is that one of the questions that you aim to answer? Like, what percent of the exclusion zone is used to make energy? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, and 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 um, well, I, uh, I'm not sure where where to d- direct this question. The uh, first thing is that you know this energy. Yeah, uh, we need to know uh, the extent to which this energy is used. But um, getting getting funding is um, you know is a critical issue for us. And my lab has been pretty well funded for my entire career. Uh, the more um, radical, shall I say, you get in your, your ideas, the more difficult it is to to get funding. And I, I think a lot of people uh, realize that. And so, getting f- funding from the usual government sources uh, is a is a real challenge um, for various reasons that we could go into if <laughs> if there's time. But uh, and so we've had a private funder. Um, for uh, a few years, but unfortunately, uh, he, he was funding us amply, and uh, uh, he really believed strongly in our work. But he ran into a financial problem; he had to stop. And so, 
we're, we were able to get a modest amount of money from a, a foundation, but we're we're looking for support, and um, it, you know it has to. It seems that it has to come from someone who believes in the kind of of science that we're doing, which is basically fundamental and extends beyond beyond uh, uh, health. It extends to uh, other uh, regions, uh, other areas, because because the water contains energy. You see, and and wherever you got water. You have energy, and there are the various issues that come up um, uh, in so many different spheres where water is involved and energy is involved. And so this is this is a, it could be a, a really big deal. But getting funding to explore those areas, we can't do it without money because you know you need to hire people, and hiring a postdoc costs something like a hundred thousand dollars a year if you add the fringe benefits. Um, uh, yeah. So anyway, I uh, I don't I don't mean to this to be a pitch to get money, but I'm I'm just saying that all of these questions, these important questions, really need to be asked, and there aren't many people who are asking them. So we would like to be able to answer a whole whole bunch of questions. Uh, even now, the the cancer uh, question that you know so many people. Uh, have either suffered from cancer or knows have lost somebody through cancer, and the war on cancer is now what is it more than fifty years old? Started by President Nixon, and hasn't the war has not been won? You know, so we need to look at new new ways uh, to look at cancer and and other issues, and we're doing that. So I'm sorry if I if I deviated from um, from your uh, uh, question. Um, but uh, um, it's really important. No, it's it's. I, I hope uh, if Bitcoin or gold and silver takes off, count me in. <laughs> I'll, I'll remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's 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 really great. Um, was I had another uh, question? I'm trying to remember. Well, I guess I was going to say just the implications of that. You know, not only for cancer, but all sorts of different degenerative diseases, uh, neurodegeneration, I'm sure, uh, the the therapies are probably pretty cost effective. I mean, I have a million light devices laying around and a lot of them emit infrared light. And uh, I mean, even just I have a wood burning barrel sauna outside and that's that's just the cost of wood to run it. <laughs> well, that may be why uh, saunas are so uh, effective and uh, why the Finns and the Russians have learned a lot more than maybe uh, the, the rest of us because basically that heat is is infrared energy. So you, you sit in the sauna, or as the Finns would say, the sauna, uh, or as the Russians would say, the banya, uh, you know, and you're absorbing infrared uh, energy. And so it builds easy water. And, you know, you walk in with, with pains and headache and depression and you come out feeling great. Um, and I, I've experienced this myself. Um, and and the reason I think is very simple that uh, the infrared energy builds easy water and whatever organs in your body, ranging from your brain to your heart to to your uh, kidneys, everything is functioning better, uh, and so you feel good when you when when you come out. It, it's so simple. There, there are you know there are other ways of uh, of building easy water, and and they're they're known to be pretty effective. But I I think. People haven't realized that many, if not all of, well, I shouldn't say all, but many of these methods are, are based on the same principle that they generate infrared energy and build easy water, you know, like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. For example, um, a postdoc of mine went to work for a company that deals in that. He came back to me a year later saying, hey, have you ever heard of hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Yeah, I heard of it. He said, do you know, it's not just wound healing. Uh, that's how it all started. It was very effective in that. But he said, uh, our our company is working on uh, using hyperbaric oxygen therapy, he said, for 29 different syndromes. Like, you know, it takes care of everything. And so we're scratching our heads together. How could that be? Um, and the only thing we could think of was, well, maybe it builds easy water all over your body. 
you know, so whatever is deficient in easy water and can't function as well because of that deficiency, build up the easy water. So we tested it and we published a paper. We showed that if you increase the oxygen, you get bigger EZs. And if you increase the pressure, you get bigger EZs. So, you know, if you combine the two of those, as in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it builds easy water. So whatever your problem, you know, you can immerse yourself in one of those chambers and you 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 should feel better. So, and then uh, uh, there's the issue of like juicing, you know. So uh, my late wife used to do that. She used to go into our backyard. We have a little garden. And she used to take the leaves from the fresh uh, vegetables and plants and she'd come in and crush them and get the juice out of them. You know, and we drink and didn't taste too good, but um, you know you can improve the taste by squeezing a little bit of um, uh, crushed strawberries or something in, in it, and and um, you know various medical practitioners uh, have told me that they tell their patients this is the simplest thing you can do to get healthy, but when you drink that, what are you drinking? Well, you're drinking the inside of the plant cells, and the insides of the plant cells. Uh, just like our cells, are filled with easy water, especially if they're fresh and new, and uh, uh, then they have a full complement of easy water. So by drinking easy water, you're, you, you're essentially replenishing any missing easy water in your body and making you healthy. So again, it shouldn't matter what, uh, uh, particularly which, which syndrome you have. Um, if, you, if you drink that that juice, you know, o- over time, it should act to to repair whatever is is deficient. And you know, I've heard anecdotal reports. Uh, I, I haven't looked to see if anything is published uh, that, that you know it seems to work. So what I what I'm trying to to convey is that there are various simple methods. Um, that build easy water, and and these methods are effective in promoting health. Hmm. So, so with the juicing, um, I guess a big question is: consuming external easy water does that directly translate to building easy in our body? Because that's what a lot of brands are using now, with whether it's you know water devices or whatever little biohacking health devices. Is that claim that? You know, you can okay. consume structured water. That's it's a, a is that yeah. uh, it, it's uh, you know, and my 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 thoughts are always based on simplicity. I think nature works in the simplest way possible, and and it's always um, it had always I I'd always be scratching my head. You know, if you drink easy water, how does that easy water get into your cells? And it's not been so easy to easy, if you pardon the expression, not so easy um, to figure that out. And then suddenly a thought arose, and I, I think this this thought has some traction. The easy water that you drink has negative charge. And what you're doing is you're basically drinking negative charge. And that negative charge finds its way really easily all over your body. Whatever is deficient in negative charge uh, the the electrons will will go, and we found uh, in the laboratory indeed that if you just take ordinary water and you put negative charge in the water through an electrode, it builds easy. It was one of our earliest findings, um, and so I think the same thing happens in your body. You're drinking the easy water, and it's not the easy water itself that does. It's a negative charge in the easy water that permeates your body and goes wherever easy is deficient and builds easy. I think that's how it works. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I always like experimenting. I'm very fortunate to be on a spring that feeds the whole house. And I'm always, you know, I'll try anything in the health field. <laughs> so I'll, I'll mount all these things to the walls and spin the water. And I'm sure you're familiar with Victor Schauberger. Um, yes. And the, the whole vortexing thing, which, um, you know, is very popular right now. And there's all these... I think Bed Bath and Beyond at one point sold. A, I think they just went out of business, but they sold a vortexer. <laughs> Maybe that's why they went out of business. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I've got to tell you that, um, uh, of course, I know the work of Victor Schauberger and um, you know his grandson um, uh, Georg uh, Schauberger put a 
uh, put up a, a museum uh, in the Alps uh, to demonstrate all of his grandfather's great achievements. But I've yet to find a good study, um, a comprehensive study of water that's being vortexed and that it produces uh, uh, so-called living water that he was talking about, which I think is probably the same as easy water. The study needs to be done. We did some studies, and I uh, it was done by an undergraduate student, and it, it, it showed some modest effect, but nothing staggering. And I think that study needs to be done. Someone needs to study vortexing and needs to confirm what Victor Schauberger was espousing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or, or try all these different health devices that people are sending, uh, selling to structure water and test all of them, right, to see which ones were well, actually doing something. Uh, absolutely. You know, they, they made great claims, but I, you have to look at the evidence. And, 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 and on that issue uh, in particular, you know, on the water that it comes out of these devices and such, or various spring waters. Uh, I get asked that question. Uh, I wouldn't say daily, but so frequently, someone will send an email, which water should I drink? Or which gadget should I use to produce the water? And that, mm-hmm. my response is always, I don't know. And I, I really don't know. I could say theoretically uh, uh, what I think might be better. But the, 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 the way to check that is, in fact, to do clinical trials, the same way as um, would be done for uh, something produced by Big Pharma, you know, which, so, so uh, for example, you take patients that have uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, and, and one group um, uh, drinks water from spring A, and the other one drinks water from the tap or uh, water produced by some company, you know, and, and how do they fare? Uh, after uh, uh, you know several months or so, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, clinical trials need to be done, and they need to be done not by a company that has some investment in it, but by some neutral party, party in, that really understands water, but has no stake in the outcome. Um, and then it, it would be miraculous because everybody wants to know, you know, which water should I drink? Uh, if I'm forced um, to to uh, produce an opinion, uh, I would say that water that contains EZ, uh, confirmed to uh, contain EZ, should be good for your health. But that's theoretical, you know, and uh, I, it, there needs to be experimental uh, evidence uh, for that. And, uh, well, you see, I think the NIH would be... Uh, would be the organization to do it, but I think that the word water is not in their dictionary. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't know it. They never heard the word water. It's like a foreign foreign yeah. language uh, to them. You know, water? Why? Why? Why is that important? So, I don't think that will happen. Uh, uh, I hope it does happen, but you know, I would like to see uh, uh, maybe maybe um, a benefactor who thinks that water. Uh, is useful and wants to know, uh, you know, which water should I drink? Um, could could set up something. I, I think I think it could be done for uh, five or ten million dollars. A reasonable study. Uh, the drug companies to test a, uh, a new pharmaceutical would be. I've heard numbers like a hundred million or even two hundred million dollars. You know, and they awesome. they make lots of profit. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been researching melatonin. And I guess that's more effective than uh, remdesivir, and the treatment cost. You know, it's like eight grand for a week of that versus melatonin, a couple dollars or whatever. <laughs> wow! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's good income for those who invest in the pharmaceutical companies, uh, but that's not our goal, <laughs> right? Well, I think I've heard you talk about, and, and maybe it was even in your book, uh, Jello or or gelatin and. For a couple of years, I was making homemade gummies. Unfortunately, with C and H refined sugar, now I would make it with honey. <laughs> but um, is gel or gelatin a rich source of of easy? Yeah, I think all gels, all all hydrogels, that is gels made of water. You know, you have to ask the question: Well, in the gummies or other other gels, what holds the water in? <laughs> if it's liquid water, it'll come. 
oozing out or pouring out, you know, and it, it doesn't happen. So there's something different about about the water. And 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 we've we've investigated some gels and we have determined that the gel is filled with easy water. If it's a hydro gel, and that is a gel where it, the initial liquid is is water. So yes. And at the surface of these gels, also the EZ extends from the surface by, uh, I mentioned, by uh, a few hundred micrometers. Uh, uh, and we've seen, in some cases, a millimeter. And in some extreme cases, we've seen even even a meter. Uh, we wow. constructed a chamber that's a meter long. And uh, the exclusion that, that zone that we see tends to uh, narrow down to a kind of dendritic structure that projects all the way to the end of the chamber. Uh, it's really quite amazing. It's a crystal, you know, crystals grow. And, uh, uh, and what I, created that one? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by what- or, 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 or what made the easy grow to a, mil, to a meter? It, 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 it grows naturally. If you, if you put it into a chamber that's long enough, you know- Oh, you, I see. I see. Chambers are only- <laughs> Uh, you know, a few centimeters. Got it. Okay. Yeah, but there were a couple of creative students in the lab, and they they asked, "Well, what happens if we have a giant chamber? How how, how big can the exclusion zone grow?" And initially, uh, we had thought that um, you know that you, you you put it's a cylindrical chamber, and you put a coin like gel at one end, and we figured, well, you know, let's see how a coin. Uh, like exclusion zone would project to the end, but it didn't do that. After it grew to, um, the exclusion zone grew to maybe a, a millimeter or so, it tapered down in, into like a pole-like structure that went all the way to the end of the chamber. Sometimes it bifurcated and became like two two of them. Sometimes it would return. It would grow, hit the end, and start to return. Um and it would be sensitive to light. You shine light on it, it would move, if I remember, away from the light. Um, so, um, you know, it, it had a lot of interesting properties. And it, 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 so it seems that it, this crystal, this easy crystal, can grow essentially indefinitely and forever. Uh, wow, that's incredible. Uh, any thoughts on like deuterium depleted water? If that's efficacious, have you studied it or? Uh, well, my doctor says I should be drinking it. <laughs> I, uh, I have a doctor who is, um, you know, for, forward, forward thinking in in these matters. Yeah. Well, so I I first heard of deuterium depleted water uh, at a meeting in in um, Russia in Saint Petersburg when meetings could be held in Russia. Uh, it was a lovely meeting on a it was on a boat actually um, on the Neva River. Uh, starting in St. Petersburg, it's fun to have a conference on a boat. Uh, almost everything was in Russian, so I, you know, I had a bit of a difficult time. But but anyway, uh, as we were approaching the boat, there was a young Russian researcher, and he started telling me about deuterium depleted water, and I had no idea what you know. He said, "Oh yeah, you know, we we found that it's really good for health." Um, and and really, that's. That's as far as I I know. Um, you know, I'd like to be involved in trying to figure out um, how how that how it happens. And um, you know, I have the feeling um, it it could be that if you have deuterium depleted water, um, the EZ uh, might grow more extensively because if you have some deuterium sitting in the in the matrix of EZ, it's different from uh, from everything else and it might preclude effective growth of the easy I, I i don't know if that's the case we have no evidence but i'd like to be able to study it but again you know we have a limited bandwidth uh can can't study everything but i guess that's where i i i put my bets but i'm not sure mm -hmm. uh does electromagnetic radiation emr emf is that lower easy yeah, we uh, well, of course, it depends on what kind of radiation, mm -hmm. and we 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 got into studies of uh, uh, of Wi-Fi, and we put a router um, next to a, a chamber and in, in which uh, there was easy, and turned on the router, and the easy diminished in size by about uh, 
fifteen uh, percent or something like that. And and we wrote a manuscript uh, that, as the student who was doing work, wrote the manuscript. And I can't find the student. I don't know where he disappeared to. So it's sort of sitting in limbo, and um, we never got to uh, trying to publish the results because I can't find the student. I don't know where he disappeared to, uh, but um, he was, you know, a very active, intelligent, um, uh, eager student. Um, but I can't find him. <laughs> so anyway, that's the extent to which we studied it. And there, you know, uh, maybe you. have Read the book. The the uh, it's called I think the Invisible Rainbow. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that book is pretty convincing. It presents so much evidence for the effect of electromagnetic radiation on health. And you know, I I must admit that myself, I'm I've got I'm sitting on my sofa at home right now, and I've got the laptop sitting on my lap, and um, I did get rid of Wi-Fi, and I'm connected uh, with a wire um, uh, to the Ethernet. It's a bit cumbersome, but it works pretty well. And so, um, yeah, um, um, it's quite, if you look at the evidence, you've got to be convinced that something is going on, needs to be studied more. Um, Absolutely. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Out here we have Starlink, and I just put it on a a timer, a, a sleep timer where it's from midnight to 6 a.m. or whatever it's off which i think is a practical way to go about it where you don't have to get you know too too crazy unless you have a serious health condition that's kind of my my perspective well yeah i i didn't have a cell phone until uh, uh nine months ago uh it was partly because my daughter told me dad you're you're too connected if you get a cell phone that you're going to drive you crazy <laughs> so that coupled with the you know, the issues of, um, um, is it, does it impact health or doesn't it impact health? I decided against, but it's become almost impossible to get around without a cell phone. Um, you know, so I succumbed. So now I'm, I'm learning to work my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> I love the notes. That's my favorite aspect of it. But, um, <laughs> thoughts on grounding or, or earthing and easy. Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so the earth is negatively charged. A lot of people don't know that. You know, I studied electrical engineering to get started. It was my undergraduate degree. And um, uh, we also talk about grounding or earthing. And, um, you know, I I never heard from any professor who even hinted that that if you plug into the receptacle on the wall, that third prong, was not connected to an absolutely neutral earth. Grounding meant uh, connected to um, neutral to uh, and when someone a Russian guy came to me about 10 years, 12 years ago, who was working in my lab and he said, he started talking about the earth's electric field. He said, Andre, what, what the hell are you talking about? You know, um, what do you mean by the earth's electric field? You must be talking about the earth's magnetic field, which everybody has heard of, the Earth's electric field? He said, of course. Don't you know that the Earth is negatively charged and the ionosphere up there is positively charged? And it's sort of like a capacitor. Um, uh, you, you've got positive there and negative here, and you have an electric field running between those plates of the of the capacitor, and the Earth is negatively charged. And I said, Andre, you must be on some kind of drug. <laughs> I I never heard of such a thing. So I went home with my head swimming. Next morning, one of my students comes in with um, um, the the lectures lectures of uh, Richard Feynman, the great Nobel physicist, and he bookmarked uh, or he had a a real bookmark chapter volume two, chapter nine, and it, it dealt with the evidence. For the Earth's negative charge, and you know those lectures are fifty years old, approximately, and the the evidence came from fifty years before. So so quite long ago, um, everybody knew uh, there was ample evidence that the Earth was negatively charged. It's just that uh, we don't learn that in school. And uh, I told Andre, I said, I you know I never heard of such a thing. He said, Well, 
you know, the American educational system must be deficient because in Russia, every middle school student knows that the earth is negatively charged. And actually inquired some uh, some students um, who are contemporary age who came from Russia. Uh, yeah, of course, we learned that in middle school, uh, that the earth is negatively charged. I had also inquired from a student, a, a younger student, who, and they don't know anything about that. So even the Russians have stopped teaching that the earth is negatively charged. But this is nothing short of incredible. I mean, it, it's so important that the earth is negatively charged. It's not just a you know, a passing observation, because uh, one of the issues is grounding or earthing. So you're connecting yourself, if you connect yourself electrically to the earth, you're connecting yourself um, to a practically infinite source of negative charge. Now, what does that do? Well, if, you're, if your uh, body is missing negative uh, charges somewhere and, you know, like, uh, you know, your kidney cells are not functioning as well. Um, and it's because you're lacking easy water. Uh, the kidney cells don't have enough negative charge. By connecting yourself to the earth, that negative charge then flows into your body and and can flow in, and replenish your kidney cells with easy water. Because as I mentioned earlier, all you need to do is add electrons uh, to the water and you get easy water. It's what we found in the laboratory. So I, I think this is my explanation. Maybe other people have other explanations for why earthing or grounding is good for health. It's it's a sort of no-brainer, I think. Yeah, that ma it makes sense to me. Um, let's see. I think I'm trying to see if we have anything else uh, that you wanted to talk about before we jump into the questions. I guess... One thing we didn't cover too much yet is like how water carries information um, yeah. on that whole topic. Oh, well, I'm not <laughs> sure where to start on that. <laughs> there's, there's so much to say. Um, I, I guess um, as an opening statement, uh, the evidence is overwhelming. Um, I would I would put it there. Um, and um, 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 I each year, I organize a conference, a conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water, and um, we're in our, I think, sixteenth year right now. And at each one of these conferences, there are two or three people who come with evidence uh, for information in in water, and it, it it extends from from spiritually oriented people, which is not scientific evidence. Uh, to Nobel laureate, um, you know, all all the way through, and so in, in, you know, you might you might think of starting with someone uh, who is well known among spiritually oriented people. That's Masaru Emoto, and you know about that, but maybe your some of your listeners are not so aware. So he would focus his intention on water, on, um, and and um. Uh, and he would freeze the water and look at the ice crystals that formed. And his claim was that if he focused positive information on the water, uh, he would get beautiful crystals. And if he focused negative information, he'd get ugly crystals. Uh, and he, he wrote a book that was that sold millions of, of copies. And there's actually another book that came out a couple of years ago, um, pretty much uh, uh, similar. And I'd been very well connected with those people, but but the problem is this: the problem, uh, and the reason why scientists don't take that as seriously as they might otherwise, is that Emoto would would take fifty petri dishes full of water, and he'd focus his intention on all fifty, and and then he would look in the microscope at at the crystals uh, that form, and he would pick out the best one to illustrate what he wants to illustrate, and uh, you know. And he claimed, he said, well, I'm a spiritualist, not a scientist, therefore I don't have to do it using the scientific method. Okay, so he started spiritualists like him, and uh, there are some scientists who further investigated and could demonstrate that actually um, even objective analysis shows that it was correct, um, as statistically significant, just barely, but significant. And then you go to the other end, there are many scientists, uh, 
uh, who have produced different kinds of evidence about uh, structuring or information in, in, in water. And uh, you wind up at one end of the scale with Luc Montagnier. And he, as you know, he won the Nobel Prize for uncovering uh, HIV. Um, um, and I, I, he died, he passed away about a year ago. Um, I knew him quite well. Came to our conference uh, for every year, uh, for over a decade. And his his main experiment um, that got him in trouble <laughs> um, was... He took, he showed, he showed an incredible amount of memory. Um, he would take DNA suspended in a buffer, in an aqueous buffer, uh, and it often diluted, and the container was very well sealed. Nothing could get out. Um, and next to it, he put water. And his hypothesis was that information on the sequence of the DNA uh, was imparted somehow electromagnetic or some kind of energy to the nearby water. He took the water and he created new DNA uh, using the PCR um, uh, reaction that's the same as we now is now widely used for COVID. Um, and he demonstrated that the new DNA that was produced, the sequence was the same as that of the DNA that was sitting next to the water. Now, um, uh, of course, Nobody would believe him at first, and I, I heard the story of how he presented this um, at the annual meeting of Nobel laureates, um, and he was laughed off the stage. They said, this is junk. This is garbage. This is impossible. This is stupid. Uh, how could you, po a Nobel laureate, how could you possibly do that? Well, now it's been confirmed by three different laboratories, uh, published two Italian and one Chinese. So, you know, we have to think that it might be true, um, with lots of people in between demonstrating. So, so yes, uh, there's ample evidence from many more people than I've I, I, I've just mentioned. Each one using different technique, um, and the question is, well, how is it possible? Well, I think it it may be difficult to imagine that that could happen in ordinary liquid water, because in liquid water the molecules are bouncing around fiercely at many times per even femtosecond, and they're randomly oriented, you know, that's not a good substrate for storing information. Easy water, on the other hand, is a great substrate because it has it has just exactly the same characteristics um, as, as do um, silicon-based memory. Um, the the uh, easy, uh, the atoms in, inside the oxygens and hydrogens are ordered, and the oxygens can take on multiple states, uh, not just two states, uh, like in silicon, but actually five different oxidation states. So, so the possibility is that the information that's stored in water is actually stored in easy water. And of course, we're terribly interested in pursuing that um, because not only of its intrinsic interest, uh, but also in, in thinking about computers of the future, the the information, if it is indeed stored there, would be stored at the atomic level rather than at the uh, transistor level, which exists right now. We calculated that if this is indeed, if we're indeed correct in surmising that easy water is the substrate that holds the information, computers would be at the size of a pinhead. Um, it's uh, awesome. the storage capacity would exceed what exists today by an order of ten to the ninth power. That's a billion times. Um, so, wow! You'd be you'd easily lose your computer. <laughs> <laughs> you'd drop it in the toilet or something like that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, uh, I'm not sure what else to say. There's there's a whole bunch of, of stories I can tell you um, uh, about water memory and people whose careers got demolished because they were advocating um, water memory. Uh, uh, but I think we're we're going to run out of time. <laughs> it sounds like we want to have a lot of easy water in our memory center, like the hippocampus you know, that they call the memory center of the brain, or just the brain in general, right, to stave off Alzheimer's and dementia. And, uh, I think that it it might be possible in the future. Yeah, you know, information information could be conveyed to the brain to other 
other organs in, in your body to um, restore the more pristine uh, condition. It, it could also be used in negative ways, uh, but I don't need to talk about that. But it's an exciting area. I think this is a frontier era. Uh, area. You know, uh, 250 years ago, if someone had mentioned to you about electromagnetic waves, you'd scratch your head and say, what the hell are you talking about? I never heard of such a thing. You know, this could be a, a kind of energy, a subtle energy that that seems to be there, but but we can't understand it at, at this time. It absolutely needs to be studied in depth. Uh, but, you know, the issue is uh, um, where, where do you get money to do that? Um, everything costs money. And yeah, I don't mean to dwell on that. <laughs> Uh, do we have time for a couple questions? Uh, a couple Andrew? questions, and I'm afraid I must go. Okay, yeah, I'll ask the quick ones here. It's my friend from my friend John. Um, I don't know if this is true. He said, when structured water is introduced to unstructured water, it can begin to structure it. How rapid of a process is this, uh, and how much unstructured water can be converted? With yeah, I don't know how, uh, the rest of that question, but I guess how fast it happens or. Well, um, yeah, I mean, so so uh, the answer is uh, yes, uh, it, it it can happen. So it happens naturally. If you if you think of what happens, you take a, a, a gel or a polymeric substance or something next to water, and and the easy starts growing. And what it's doing is basically it's converting converting actual liquid water into easy water. So the question can be answered directly. Uh, or part of the question by saying, well, how rapidly does this occur? And it occurs, if I remember the numbers right, it's about one um, uh, one micrometer uh, per second is, uh, I think if I have the numbers right, is the rate at which it grows. Uh, you know, so by extension, if you were to take some easy and put it in water, and uh, put it in liquid water, it could grow potentially by roughly that speed. How much of the water would be converted into easy water is not so clear because, you know, when you build easy water, you also build protons beyond. And we found that those protons beyond limit the growth of easy water. So if you could get rid of the protons, uh, it can grow pretty well. Um, and if you can't get rid of the protons, then it won't grow. So the answer is, uh, I mean, there's no simple answer to that question. Sorry. That's great. That's great. Um, question for me, can we do at-home experiments? Like I know earlier in the interview, you mentioned really small electrodes. You can't just take a, a multimeter and use that, right, to measure? <laughs> no, it doesn't work. And it doesn't work, it doesn't work with um, ordinary metal electrodes, even if they're tapered to a fine tip. Hmm. Uh, and the reason is not actually not so clear. Um the electrodes that were invented by Gilbert Ling, they're made it. They're, they start with a, a a glass tube that cu that gets tapered through heat uh, to a very fine tip with a little hole in it, and you can stick them in a cell and they'll measure the cell potential and the action potential, whatever, whatever you want to measure with impunity. It doesn't hurt hurt the cell. You can withdraw it and stick it into another cell, and you can get good measurements. If you try to do the same thing with a metal electrode, it doesn't work. And we're trying to figure out right now, uh, what the reason is. And the possibility is that these glass electrodes are filled with three molar KCL. And we're looking at KCL, and um, the three molar KCL seems to form easy water. And it's possible that the easy water is like a superconductor. We don't know that, but we're studying about the possibility. And so you need something like a really good superconductor stick in the cell to measure the electrical potential. Uh, wow. Yeah. So um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how it goes. You know, and and the reason I reason we're studying this is mainly because uh, we found that we could actually uh, stick uh, two of those electrodes, one in the EZ and one beyond the EZ, and that gives you an electrical potential difference. And we could light an LED with that. Um, I mean, we demonstrated that that we can do it, which means this is a, an energy source that goes well beyond what we're talking about biology. You can use this 
effectively, you can use it as a solar cell. You stick two electrodes in, you've got infrared light all around you, and you get electrical current out of it. Um, and the, the, the remaining question is, is um, um, you know, how, how efficient is it? Can it get scaled up to practical use? And we haven't, we haven't gone there yet, but we're looking to, uh, to attempt to do that. It, it, it comes directly from, you know, from the science of uh, what we found. So we have proof of principle, but we don't know yet the practicality of it. Being fully off grid here, I'm, I'm even more excited now to, uh, <laughs> to, to invest. And in. where, where can people do that, by the way? Uh, um, should they email you for large investments? And then I think you have a, yes. a donate link for smaller ones. Well, I, yeah, I thought there was a donate link on our, our website, but I, I either it was removed or it's not there. But yeah, just uh, I'm easily reachable, uh, uh, ghp at uw.edu, ghp at uw.edu. And I'm, you know, happy to discuss with anyone. Uh, there's so much, so much, so exciting to do, both from from a fundamental scientific aspect and, and also um, practical applications. Wow. Well, well, I love how humble you are. That's really rare that I find uh, someone so art- intelligent, articulate, but also humble. So you're uh, a rare gem. And uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing your information. Well, thank you for your comments. I, I really appreciate that. Okay. Anyway, right. I really enjoyed this. I'm sorry. I need to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. There, Jerry, thanks so much. Uh, stick around as we close out the show. That's all for today's show. As Jerry mentioned, you can head over to pollocklab.org, and that's Pollock with two L's. If you want to donate or you know someone that is in a position to donate to a really important cause, uh, send them to that website. I really appreciate his ability to break down these really complex biology and chemistry concepts into analogies that are easy to understand. I don't think that's being done enough. I think a lot of people are using these big words in the natural health community that don't mean anything, especially to people that are sick. So to have people like Jerry out there in the field that's really breaking things down in an easy to understand way, I think is invaluable. And on his website, if you click on publications, you can see the books that he's published and actually missed one in the intro, uh, the muscles and molecules uncovering the principles of biological motion. I would say of the material that I've read from Jerry, the fourth phase of water book was the easiest for me to understand. And all the illustrations in there really helped as well. I think it was complicated for me because I went through you know, 12 years of school and then went to college and didn't learn this stuff. And I believe this information should be taught in grade school and maybe even kindergarten. And so to learn this at 36 years of age, chronological myself, that makes it a lot harder to digest this information. So if we can get this information that Jerry is sharing into the minds of children, I think that's where it's super beneficial and something that I wish I experienced. I think we could do so much better with the education system. It's really gone downhill since about the 50s and 60s, teaching our children real history, real science, real applicable information that they could apply to improve their health. This is really what's missing our education system. And I speak from experience being four years in a juvenile detention facility and seeing firsthand the mind-numbing effects of the modern education system. It's really horrendous and depressing. If you want to check out my website, it's matt-blackburn.com. I have my CLF protocol, my recommended products. If you click on shop, see my favorite water filter that I designed from scratch seven stage water filter that's contaminant free acid free and properly mineralized that's not a private label that was built from scratch that is better than any 
drinking water filter on the market because I'm not just copying some system. We built this from the ground up and it's really easy to maintenance. It's open source with the twist off filters. You can mix and match depending on your source water. Just really proud of that unit. And that'll be back in stock in the next few weeks. You'll notice on the website, I have a lot of different water products or products that can be used with water. And my health journey that began in the year 2010 was really centered around water. And that's what pulled me into green vegetable juicing, organic, fresh vegetable juicing. And maybe it was the easy water that helped cleanse 25 years of sins of not being aware of what I was putting in my body and just putting absolute slop in my body for a couple decades. I, th I think for people at that level, even green vegetable juicing, even with the fertilizer and all the stuff, it could be a short-term beneficial upgrade. But then you start to learn about the NPK fertilizer and the tap water they're growing in and you keep going down the rabbit hole ideally heading closer and closer to having your own greenhouse or fruit orchard with filtered water and moving into higher and higher quality water for your home garden. That's obviously ideal. And then you get into drinking water and the state of municipal water. It's really, really bad. Really interesting story. You have a La Marzocco fancy espresso machine. It's top of the line, Italian made. They make really good stuff. There's a water reservoir on there that it draws from to push the water through the coffee grounds to make your espresso shots. And when we were living down in Southern California, I had a massive $10,000 whole house filter. I mean, this is like lab grade water, almost distilled but using reverse osmosis. And there's a little sensor, a water sensor in the water reservoir on this really fancy espresso machine. And what that does is it measures that there's water in there. So if there's not enough water, it's not gonna run, it's not gonna ruin the machine. And it tells you to pour more water in. So I'm up here in Idaho when we're on a spring and I pour that water in the water reservoir for the first time and it's saying there's not water in there because it's so pure that it doesn't register. And of course, this was actually after going through my MitoLife filter. So it was spring water going through a whole house sediment carbon UV, going through a few structuring units that I use, and then going into the MitoLife drinking water filter. The water was so pure that the machine didn't register that there was water in there. I had to add a pinch of baking soda. And we still have to do that every once in a while. Otherwise, the machine will think it's empty. Versus down in San Diego in Southern California, even though it was going through this massive whole house filter, it was not taking out everything apparently because we never had to add baking soda. It would always register the water. So I tell that story just to make the point that even being almost 14 years now into studying natural health and experimenting with water, I'm still learning things about water, which is really cool. And talking with someone like Jerry, I get even more excited because there's so much that I don't know and understand about water. And it's something that we interact with intimately every day. I just think that's really cool. So on my shop, you can see all of the different water devices that I have up there. Obviously, the drinking water filter that I designed, but also Analemma water wand. They recently released a whole house unit, which I have hooked up at my house. There's the deuterium depleted water that we drink or cats drink. Then more of the esoteric stuff. I have the Infopathy on there. I interviewed the founder on the podcast. That's InfoCeutical imprinting, which I find really effective if you're on municipal tap water. That's when I really tell the difference when I'm traveling with it and visiting family. When I use that on the tap water after it's gone through the filter, 
totally different mouthfeel. That's one of my favorite things to travel with. And then I have molecular hydrogen tablets, which have become really popular. The ones I have up there are from Vital Reaction. And those are really good to take when you're traveling, if you're intermittent fasting, flying on a plane, really good idea to take those. I'll kind of alternate those in vitamin C, but not at the same time. I learned that the hard way because that's very alkaline and ascorbic acid. My vitamin C is a weak acid, but it's an acid solution. So you don't want to mix an acid and a base that's not going to go well in your stomach and it's going to end badly. So I would wait a good amount of time after taking the hydrogen before taking your vitamin C. Then I have the molecular resonance effect technology, MRET, uh, water activator from Shen Blossom. That's one of my favorite things to use after the water goes through the water filter. Of course, you can keep stacking these things, but what's really unique about this device is it uses a frequency and you get, there's a little light that you can see that it beams down into the water. You fill it to a specific level. It's like a millimeter below the top part of the unit. And then you click a button and it'll run for about 20 minutes. And then you have some pretty powerful water that comes from a patent by Igor Smirnov, PhD, uh, 6022479, that uses a subtle low frequency EMF field that's imprinted into the water. The idea is that it matches the natural geomagnetic field found near healing springs. And the water dynamics are compatible with what Dr. Gilbert Ling described. And then you could ozonate your water. I've been doing that for years. Uh, the first unit, I bought was from Sota out of Canada, and that just pulls ambient air, which is great. It's a fantastic introduction to ozone, especially drinking ozonated water. And then the next level would be getting an oxygen tank from like a welding supply shop and running that through a cold quartz ozone generator. And that way you don't get nitrosamines, you don't get these impurities that you get by pulling air into the device directly, just ambient air, pulling it directly from high purity an oxygen tank, you're getting medical grade pure ozone. We use that to wash all of our greens every time I eat a salad, ozonate it, but it's really powerful to get cold water and then run like it's like a little aquarium airstone bubbler into a cold glass of water. Of course, run the fan, open the windows in the room that you're doing that. We have it in our bathroom. And that's really powerful for the gut and for a lot of different conditions is to drink ozonated water. And then shower filter. I'm still surprised that a lot of people aren't using a shower filter I have the one on my website that I used for years. I'm actually working on developing a really powerful one that's not going to break. I tried a shower filter down in Southern California when I was living down there and it broke in transit. So a lot of these are just cheaply made, not packaged properly. And that's been my experience with a lot of water filtration units over the years. So Mito Life is doing it differently. We have a bulletproof box that is why the project has been delayed a month. So the UPS driver can probably drop kick it like an NFL player and it will still make it to your front door. And then there's the Soma Vedic. They recommend putting your glass of water directly on the Soma Vedic unit. That's crushed crystals with electricity run through it. I mean, there's a million things you could do. And then we didn't even talk about the bathing water and all the things you could do with that. Oh, and I forgot the magnesium bicarbonate. That's something that I popularized several years ago, and now it's trendy. But my friend Charles over at Crucial 4 has the mag bicarb, magnesium hydroxide powder, and that's a really powerful thing. I always tell people if they don't have the money to buy supplements, 
just get a soda stream, get a carbonator and carbonate water and add magnesium hydroxide to it. And the mag bicarb from Crucial 4 is just a higher purity than what you would get from bulk supplements and other websites. And shake it up. You know, there's videos. I have a video on it on YouTube from years ago. And make your own magnesium bicarbonate and sip it on an empty stomach. Do shots throughout the day on an empty stomach. I have to get back into it. I've been off of it for a while. It just happens with the millions of different health protocols out there. Right now, I'm just taking my MitoLife Mag ATP product, but I like combining all of it. I feel the best when I take oral magnesium pills with magnesium bicarbonate shots and bathing in magnesium at least once or twice a week. That's when I feel like I'm actually building my magnesium levels and they're not slowly depleting over time. So I just mentioned the magnesium. You could find that and all my other products over at mitolife.com. CO. We just released a new shampoo and conditioner, and we're already getting really great feedback about it. Some of the complaints were about the price, but when you start to use it, you realize how long it's going to last. Unless there's eight people using it every day in the shower, one bottle will probably last one person, if you're using it liberally, at least two months. I would say if you're being conservative and you don't have a ton of hair, you're not pumping it out of the bottle like crazy, then it probably lasts three to four months. They are essential oil free, which makes them really unique to all the other natural hair products on the market. And I just love how they smell. It's a really enjoyable experience to use those in the shower. You could find those under the living tab along with the grounding or earthing sheets. That was the thing I got into along with water in 2010. I had my dad crawl under the crawl space under my childhood home and hammer in a grounding rod for me. We sell a king and queen fitted sheet that fits around your mattress. And then non-fitted, we have available in king, queen, full, and twin size. And I highly recommend getting the ground rod kit with it for 15 bucks. And you just hammer that or mallet it or use a rock and throw that at your window and put it into the dirt as deep as it'll go. And that is much superior to grounding to the third prong on the wall outlet. If that's all you got, that's all you got and try it out. But a lot of people get better results grounding direct to the earth. And then check out all of our supplements under the wellness tab. These are all things that I use daily. The shilajit has been out for about a month or two. That will be back in stock as of this podcast being released or early next week. So just keep an eye out for that on the website if you're a fan of the Panacea Shilajit tablets, and that'll be back really soon. I love having five tablets every morning at breakfast, usually eggs, sourdough, and raw milk, and then have my two espresso shots with frothed heavy cream, MCT oil, maple syrup, and then one gram of Shilajit from the Panacea product. And then along with whatever intuitive combination of MitoLife supplements that I feel like that day because the pills add up. So lately it's been four capsules of Encephalon and a couple capsules of Jellyfish Jolt and then some magnesium And one of the fat-soluble vitamins, either E or K, or sometimes I'll do cod liver oil, not all together because they compete for absorption, but I'll separate them throughout the day with every meal. And that's a really powerful start to the day. And before that, do the dissolve it all. So first thing upon waking, dissolve it all with water, wait about 10 or 15 minutes, and then jump into breakfast. So that's it for today's show. Check out the MitoLife Academy on YouTube. That's $15 a month and you get access to two private videos every month. Latest research, latest experiments, supplements that I'm playing around with, protocols, and then a live Q&A, usually the last day of every month. So I'll see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged. Mm -hmm.